Hello everyone, welcome to the Geo Ecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and you have been watching my videos on geography and several other topics related to environment. In this session, we are going to discuss one of the most important and very less talked about subject matters in geomorphology that is periglacial cycle of erosion as well as periglacial processes and periglacial landforms. So what is important about periglacial processes and landforms is that it is very similar to glacial ones but there is a distinctiveness between the glacial and periglacial. So we are going to distinguish how you can differentiate between glacial processes that we have already discussed in glacial landforms. So if you have not watched the videos on glacial landforms you can watch it in the playlist already there in the geomorphology but today we are going to discuss about these periglacial processes and landforms and their important characteristics their cyclic nature and also some important terminologies and also their features related to it so i suggest you watch the videos till the end to understand this periglacial cycle of erosion but before we go ahead don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also do share the videos with others as well So now let's understand these periglacial landforms and also cycle of erosion. So first we'll be talking about periglacial landforms, their processes, their nature and also at the end we'll be talking about the cycle of erosion. So watch the videos till the end to understand this entire concept of periglacial region. So what you understand by the term periglacial, simple words are periglacial. So in the periphery of the glacial zone, it means it is not exactly a glaciated area, but because it is in the periphery of a glaciated area, it will have permafrost conditions. Permafrost conditions is almost permanently frozen areas or areas with sub-zero temperatures throughout the 12 months of year, right? So it has a distinctive cycle of freeze thaw. Freeze thaw is when it accumulates, when ice accumulates and when it again melts down. So this operates continuously. So we remember that there is particular spring thaw cycle that is involved in periglacial areas. Now look here, it is important to understand the earliest definition suggested that these geomorphic environments were located at periphery of the Pleistocene glaciers. Now it's very important to understand this conceptualization of these periglacial areas that many people, many scientists say that these are only those areas which are in the periphery of the Pleistocene glaciation or glaciated areas. Now what is this Pleistocene glaciation or Pleistocene glaciated areas? Remember these are those particular areas which were completely frozen during the ice age in the Pleistocene epoch that is about 2 million years to about 12,000 years ago. And after that, all these ice starts to melt. That's important. So during this particular glacial time period, we observe that most of the areas in the northern hemisphere particularly, which were land areas, were under ice. So this is when periglacial concept comes into the picture that those areas which were beyond that particular glacial zones of Pleistocene glaciation are part of these periglacial areas. That's important. So this is one way of looking at it. But remember, it's not that all these particular periglacial areas were only in the nearby zones of these glaciated areas. Why? Because remember, frost action also influences those landscapes which were not at the margin of these ancient glaciers. So for them also, periglacial areas are there. What it means? That there has to be a broad framework. Not just Pleistocene glaciation and its area surrounding is periglacial areas. Rather, any area in the periphery of any other glacier as well can be part of periglacial areas. That's important to consider. So if you look into this image, Periglacial areas are like this. It's almost sometimes somewhere you'll find it is frozen. Some parts are already melted. Some has converted into this liquid fluid water, right? So it's kind of a mixed area where you have some half frozen, some semi frozen stuff, some completely under ice and some completely barren. So it's kind of a mixed area, not completely glaciated. So that's where it is periglacial. So now let's elaborate further more. So if you look into this particular image, what you find out here? This is a cross section which says that this is a top layer and this is a bottom layer of soil. Here you have unfrozen rock soil here in this lower layer while as you go in the upper layer you will find some different areas with active layer and also some depressions where you have smaller lakes or larger lakes 
and also some kind of little plantations or you can see these particular vegetation which grows when these areas are now melting in. So what we observe there is this particular area almost 400 meters in depth which is continuous permafrost. So this is continuously frozen area. Then in between you have certain areas which are called talix. Now talix are of two types. What you see open talic and there is through talic which is unfrozen ground as you can see here. So this is the through talic part this com complete area this is through talic and then you have completely frozen areas under which there are some closed talics as well. So what are these particular areas if you find there is a mix of completely frozen area or semi frozen area as well as completely unfrozen areas. So this is where permafrost areas have a peculiar characteristic like it is mixed of you know melting of ice as well as frozen rock material. So that is important. Now let's understand the definition part that near glacial or periglacial is in the sense of location or conditions both. Now here is the catch of two words locationally in the periphery or conditionally in the periglacial stage. So perennially frozen ground that is called permafrost is majorly one characteristic then it can be seasonally thawed it means seasonally it's melting that is ground which is active layer if you see this particular area that in season it melts so new vegetation comes up while it is frozen it's completely covered. Then incomplete vegetation cover of herbaceous plants and dwarf trees this also exists in this particular areas and ground is snow free for part of a year. So of a very small part two months of a year or three months of a year largely it is unfrozen completely the ground is free of snow while frequent fluctuations of air temperatures across zero degree C that is what we talked about that is sub zero temperatures is very common in these areas. So that is the larger framework of a definition of periglacial areas. Now if you look into the periglacial processes there are five major processes if you want to look at. So what are the five processes? First is called frost action which has further different actions inside or if you classify frost action you'll find frost shattering, frost wedging, frost splitting, frost heaving. So it's like shattering you understand breaking away then wedging is sharply cutting across and splitting is dividing it heaving is pushing upwards remember when water freezes its volume increases so it's pushing the land upward if it is underground or sub ground area right then you have mass wasting in the same so remember we have already learned in the lectures on mass wasting many things so frost creeping solifluxion, fluxion or it is also called jelly fluxion so jelly is basically half or semi molten state of water which flows down the slope right that happens then there is a word called nivation now you must remember periglacial areas are related to this nivation process so what is this erosion of the ground beneath and at sides now remember ground beneath as well as in the sides of what snow bank areas mainly as a result of alternate freezing and thawing now remember contraction expansion contraction expansion this is what is freezing thawing this keeps happening so what happens the adjoining areas are laterally as well as vertically eroded gradually this is called nivation and a very most important characteristic of a particular periglacial zone then you have fluvial processes which we have already learned in details in fluvial landforms as well this happens here as well so fluctuating discharge and high variable sediment load is there in this periglacial areas why fluctuating discharge because of the reason that it is not in continuation flow because of a particular seasonal shift sometimes it is freezing sometimes it is thawing that's why so periglacial streams are commonly braided channels they are not smooth stream like uh, any fluvial area so they have a braided channel generally and aeolian processes now remember wind is also important agent not just water so wind forms also one of the most important part of these areas while periglacial environments are mantled with lowest deposit remember northern china as we know lowest deposit which goes into the Huangho river so it is called yellow river as well so upper mississippi basin and midwestern us all these areas have very fine dust wind blown dust which accumulates in these particular areas and also leads to different formations so these are five major processes so what are the landforms remember geomorphology is about process form relationship so now if you look at the processes you must also look at what are the forms how do they look like so let's see first of the periglacial landforms that you observe is these flat areas with these particular 
एज एज सर्फेसेस और एच सर्फेसेस सो वॉट आर दीज यू हैव वराइटी ऑफ सिमेट्रिकल एंड जियोमेट्रिकल शेप्स available as pattern ground in these areas if you can observe so some of them are also called ice wedges polygons now remember ice wedge polygons are these polygons if you see these are the polygons cut across the land right so if this is very famous in manitoba hudson bay lowland right so these are some of the major structures looks that you can see nivation happening freeze thaw happening so this kind of creations if you see in the periglacial landforms primarily in a flat surface then if you observe there are other features as well this particular mound if you see these are called pulsars so these pulsars are low permafrost mounds now remember these are low mounds not very huge mounds with cores of layered segregated ice and peat now remember ice and peat mud kind of coal structure which is there inside which is making a peat mound right so this is also kind of a interesting structure which is found in this particular permafrost area is called pulsars then what you have is pingos now what are these pingos these pingos are ice cored hills if you observe these hillocks or small hills if you observe these are pingos and and remember these terminologies pulsars pingos the height varies from 3 to 70 meters many times so this is what is interesting as smaller heaps of mounds of these segregated ice and peat accumulated at different places so this is from canada if you observe then you have several other features which are important for example rock glacier so look at these particular glaciers if you find these are what rock debris material which are seasonally frozen and then there is a thaw happening so these kind of glaciers which are semi frozen semi molten this is very common site then you have block fields now look at these particular rock blocks here these block fields in india you can find in several higher regions of himalayan region in rohtang areas and very other areas as well so these are what block fields which are closer to the top glaciation zone where you have these glacial actions and these huge boulders are broken off and gradually they deposit they move with time according to the slope as well so these are like block fields right these are also called felsenmuir right then you have one important feature here is called cryoplanation terraces like any other terrace in the mountain region if you observe this is a periglacial terrace which is called cryoplanation terrace and remember the process operating here is the same like parallel retreat of a slope right so this is what is happening this is what you see in this particular image and nivation flow happens and that's why you have nivation hollows at particular places as well then you have thermocarst topography in the karst landscape also we talked about thermocarst so areas where this nivation happens within the surface or in the substrate in the ground with below the surface there you find this kind of thermocarst topography happening so when they are exposed they look like these pools of water in the season right so these are some of the important features that we observe or landforms because of the processes that we observed that's important then what is about this particular periglacial cycle who talked about this cyclic event in terms of periglacial areas because remember cyclic theories were very common during division cycle peng cycle elsi king cycle so we have this particular periglacial cycle as well in which the mechanical splitting remember the splitting of rocks physically due to contraction and expansion jelly fraction that is because of the ice when rocks are split and then you have jelly turbation because of the movement of the ice churning of the ice up and down you have turbation right we have also learned about pedo turbation earlier in the soil lecture so you have jelly turbation here as well then you have solid fluxion and nivation which are also important processes that we have learned so these processes when they operate in a cyclic way it keeps on creating a periglacial cycle right so remember in 1950 lc peltier put forward the concept of periglacial cycle of erosion this gentleman here so what did he say about it he said that it was very similar to division model only but just that the region was different now this region has unique distinctive processes because it's a periglacial area so you have different phases of youth mature and old with different connotations of landforms so now let's elaborate a little on the periglacial cycle of erosion so if you observe this particular image and steps here number 1 2 3 4 which has been taken from alok ranjan is website the source is here i have not drawn it myself that's important so when you see this particular image it's very clearly 
given here, drawn here, a very wonderful work of sketch that you see that these are different particular layers and they have a particular flow. In first, you have depressions and you have these mounds. Then further, what happens because of soliflexion, because of the frost shattering, the material is eroded and transported. So what happens? These depressions will have the depositions. The tors, the rock fields, the rock boulders will finally get deposited in these particular depressions. So what will happen to the depressions? Very similar to what we learned in the geosynclinal theory. Similarly, these depressions will be gradually filled up. And what will happen to the terraces which were there earlier like mounds? They will start to gain the surface and it will start to lower down. So absolute relief will be now lowered down, right? So from initial surface, you find in the fourth stage that which were the depressions now becomes mound and which were the mounds, they become the depression. So very simple, earlier which were the depressions are now filled with the rocks gradually, they starts to become mound and which were already mound now starts to lower down. This cyclic events because of the nivation, because of the spring thaw keeps happening, which is very clear given in these stages, right? So this entire process what you see is called cryoplanation. Now remember peniplanation, pediplanation, panplanation, hplanation. We have learned about it in erosional surfaces. Here is another erosional surface for you called cryoplanation. So becoming plain from the mound. This is where you have planation happening because of erosional factors, right? This is called cryoplanation here. And remember cryoplanation involves which processes? Remember congeliturbation, soliflexion, right? Or frost action that is very intense. It's also called congelifraction. Fraction means breaking away. Right. So this happens. Basically, what you understand is breaking away and coming close. So this is happening seasonally. Sometimes it freezes. Sometimes when it thaws, it breaks away. So this freeze thaw, freeze thaw cycle is what it generates or it takes to make this periglacial cycle work. Right. So the penultimate stage of the landform, like other cycles here, is also called cryoplane or alti plane. Now, this is the terminology related to this particular periglacial cycle of erosion given by Peltier in 1950 to remember. So now, when we have discussed in details the periglacial processes, landforms and also periglacial cycle of erosion, in the sessions to come, we will be talking more on different theories related to mountain building and related processes in physical geography. So stay tuned, stay safe, keep watching.